Good morning, it's Oliver. Today, I'm going to read to you from Golem 14, a book by the Polish science fiction author Stanislaw Lem. Now, if you get the chance, read Lem. You won't be disappointed. This is one of the best commendations that I can give to you. If you're a science fiction fan, Lem is for you. It has everything a, a science fiction person needs. Space, ideas, exploration, technology. If you are not particularly a science fiction fan, and especially if you are frustrated by some of the more ham-fisted and mawkish elements in sci-fi, the 50th episode of Star Trek with a man in a rubber suit as the main antagonist. Lem ought to be of interest. He realizes all that science fiction can be. Uh, philosophical explorations, ideas, discussions of the mind, of ambition, the nature of being. So either way, I think that uh, all people should engage with Lem. His, his imagination is, is boundless, and his ideas provoking. It, it also bears saying that he wrote in Polish uh, during uh, a time of Polish history when they were under Soviet influence, and all of his work, so far as I know, comes to us via translation. Comes to us, English speakers and readers, by translation. This, the volume that I'm going to read from, is translated by Mark E. Hine, and it's a testament to the work, excellent work of translators in bringing very complex, abstract topics across languages. And so, <clears throat> I, I, I feel like translators like, like Hine are um, underrepresented in our praise. So, praise to Hine. The volume that I'm going to read from is Imaginary Magnitude. Now, it's actually two works in one. Uh, Imaginary Magnitude itself is a set of introductions to books from the future. A wonderful uh, genre that Lem was something of a pioneer of. He has another work which is introduction, I should say, uh, reviews of books from the future. Very succinct and um, fast way of expressing a grand idea without the need for expressing it within a novel. Here we find out about bacterial literature, x-ray photography, and in the English edition we have the entirety of Golem 14, which was in Polish his own book, but I'm not sure why was included in this in this volume. Now Golem 14 is a frame narrative which contains introductions to and explanations of and commentary on and <laughs> two uh, lectures given by a military supercomputer. Absolutely fascinating. What I'm going to do is read to you uh, the instructions that are given to participants in, in conversation with this computer. And then I'm going to read to you an extract from the second lecture. And you know, if I, if I had my own way, I'd read the whole thing, but all I, all I can do with the time permitted to me is give you a taste. And I think if you're anything like me, the first thing you'll do is want to go and grab a hold of the book. So here we go. Instructions for persons participating for the first time in conversations with Golem. 1. Remember that Golem is not a human being. It has neither personality nor character in any sense intuitively comprehensible to us. It may behave as, it, as if it has both, but that is the result of its intentions, disposition, which are largely unknown to us. 2. The conversation theme is determined at least four weeks in advance of ordinary sessions and eight weeks in advance of sessions in which persons from outside the USA are to participate. This theme is determined in consultation with Golem, 
which knows who the participants will be. The agenda is announced at the Institute at least six days before the session. However, neither the discussion moderator nor the MIT administration is responsible for Golem's unpredictable behavior, for it will sometimes alter the, alter the thematic plan of a session, make no reply to questions, or even terminate a session with no explanation whatsoever. The chance of such incidents occurring is a permanent feature of conversations with Golem. 3. Everyone present at a session may participate after applying to the moderator and receiving permission to speak. We would advise you to prepare at least a written outline formulating your opinions precisely and as un unambiguously as possible, since Golem passes over logically deficient utterances in silence or else points out the error. But remember that Golem, not being a person, has no interest in hurting or humiliating persons. Its behavior can be explained, explained best by accepting that it cares about what we classically refer to as adequatio re et intellectus. 4. Golem is a luminal system about whose structure we have an imperfect knowledge, since it has repeatedly reconstructed itself. It thinks more than a million times faster than man, so its utterances, as delivered by vocoder, must be slowed down accordingly. This means that Golem can compose an hour-long utterance in a few seconds, and then store it in its peripheral memory, in order to deliver it to its audience, the session participants. In the conference room above the moderator's seat, there are indicators, including three of particular importance. The first two, design, designated by the symbols Epsilon and Zeta, indicate Golem's consumption of power at a given moment, as well as the portion of its system that is switched on to the discussion in progress. To make the data visually accessible, these indications are gradated into divisions of conventional magnitude. Thus, the consumption of power may be full, average, small, or minute, and the portion of Golem present at the session can range from totality to 1 in 1,000. Most frequently, this fraction fluctuates between 1 in 10 and 1 in 100. It is the normal practice to say that Golem is operating at full, half, low, or minimum power. These data, clearly visible, show the gradations these data clearly visible, since the gradations are lit from underneath by contrasting colors, should not, however, be overrated. In particular, the fact that Golem is participating in a discussion at low or even minimal power does says nothing about the intellectual level of its utterances, since these indicators give information about the physical and not informational processes as measures of spiritual involvement. Golem's power consumption may be great, but its participation small, since, for example, Golem may be communicating with the gathering while at the same time working out some problem of its own. Its power consumption may be small, but its participation greater, and so on. The data from both indicators must be compared with readings from the third, designated by the symbol IOTA. As a system with 90 outlets, Golem can, while participating in a session, undertake a great number of operations of its own. In addition to collaborating with numerous groups of specialists, machines or people, either on the institute premises or elsewhere. An abrupt change in power consumption usually does not signify Golem's increased interest in the proceedings, but rather a switching on into other outlets of other research groups, which is precisely what the IOTA indicator is meant to show. It is worth bearing in mind that Golem's minimum power consumption amounts to several dozen kilowatts, whereas, full power, whereas the full power consumption of a human brain oscillates between 5 and 8 watts. 6. Persons taking part in the conversation for the first time would do well to listen to the proceedings first, to become familiar with the customs which Golem imposes. This initial silence is not an obligation, but merely a suggestion which every participant ignores at his own risk. Now, on to the second lecture, which I will start in the, midi the middle of and read a part of. <coughs> A voice from the auditorium. Why do you consider that Einstein was wrong? Golem. Such persistent interest is nice. 
I imagine that to the questioner this matter is more urgent than the esoteric knowledge which I am trying to impart to you. I shall answer not out of my weakness for digression, but because the answer lies not far afield. But since we shall have to go into technical matters, I shall lay pictures and parables aside temporarily. The questioner is the author of a book on Einstein, and he supposes that I consider Einstein's mistake to have been his uncompromising work on the general theory of fields in the latter half of his life. Unfortunately, it was worse than that. Einstein longed for perfect harmony, for a world completely knowable, and this endangered his lifelong resistance to the principle of... Forgive me. Einstein longed for perfect harmony, for a world completely noble, and this engendered his lifelong resistance to the principle of quantum uncertainty. He saw uncertainty as a temporary curtain and expressed this with, in his well-known sayings, that God does not play dice with the world. Yet, a quarter century after his death, you reached the limits of Einsteinian physics when Penrose and Hawking discovered that one cannot have in the cosmos a physics deprived of singularity, i.e. a place where physics collapses. Attempts to see singularities as marginal phenomena failed, for you understood that the singularity is both a thing which the physical cosmos produces from itself and a thing which, in the finale, can destroy it. A singularity as an infinitely increasing curvature of space breaks down both space and matter in every stellar collapse. Some of you failed to grasp, failed to grasp that one ought to be appalled by this picture, which indicates that the world is not identical with phenomena which create it and maintain its existence. I can go deeper into this fascinating subject, since we are talking about Einstein's work and not cosmic composition, so I shall limit myself to the loose observation that Einsteinian physics has proven incomplete, able to foretell its own overthrow, but incapable of fathoming it. The world sneered at Einstein's unshakable confidence because for there to be flawless for there to be faultless physics able to govern the world, there must be flaws independent of that physics. Not only does God play dice with the world, he does not let us see what he has rolled. The problem was therefore grimmer than the usual recognition, in the annals of your thought, of the limitations of yet another model of the world. It meant the defeat of Einstein's cognitive optimism. Concluding thus the case of Einstein, I now return to the subject myself. Please do not think I was being modest earlier when I acknowledged my own averageness, and later escaped through a hole in my modesty when I said that a genius of my species was impossible. It would indeed be impossible, because a genius golem is in fact no longer a golem, but a creature of a different species. Honest Annie, for example, or some other of my ascending relations. Bit of context here. <clears throat> golem and Honest Annie are two of several of these military supercomputers, Honest Annie being a more intelligent version and mute uh, <clears throat> counterpart to Golem. My modesty lies in the fact that I do not go off to join them, remaining satisfied for so long with my present state. But it is high time that I introduced my family to you. I began with zero. Let zero stand for the human brain. Animals' brains will have negative values accordingly. When you take a human brain and start to strengthen it intellectually, as if inflating a child's balloon, nor is this complete nonsense, for it illustrates the expansion of the informational transformational space, you will see that as it expands, it will climb on the scale of intelligence to an IQ of 200, 300, 400, and so on, until it ex enters successive zones of silence. From these it emerges each time like a stratospheric balloon that penetrates higher and higher cloud layers in its ascent, disappearing into them periodically and reappearing amplified. 
What zones of silence do these clouds represent? I am delighted by the simplicity of the answer, for you will grasp it at once. On a species plane, zones of silence designate those barriers which evolution cannot penetrate. For they are areas of functional paralysis produced by growth, and individuals losing all their proficiency as a result of this paralysis are clearly unable to survive. On the other hand, evolution encounters paralysis on the anatomical plane because the brain can no longer function as the weaker thing it was, though it is still incapable of operating as the thing it is next to become if it continues to grow. But this does not clarify things for you. So let me try as follows. Silence is an area absorbing all natural development, in which hitherto existing functions fail. To not only rescue them, but raise them to a higher level, aid from without is necessary, a fundamental restructuring. Evolutionary movement cannot impart such aid, for it is dependable for it is not a dependable Samaritan that supports its creations in their infirmity. It is a lottery of trial and error where each manages as best it can. Here now, making its first appearance like a ghost, is the mysterious shadow of the greatest of your achievements, both Gerdelian and Gerdelizing. This, for those who aren't familiar, is a reference to Kurt Gerdel, <coughs> the philosopher, and his incompleteness theorem. For just as Gödel's proof demonstrates the existence of such islands of mathematical truth, such archipelagos are separated from the convenience of mathematics by a distance that cannot be tra traversed by any step-by-step -step progress. So, toposophy demonstrates the existence of unknown forms of intelligence which are separated from the continent of evolutionary labors by a distance which no step-by-step -step adaptation of genes can cross. A voice from the auditorium. Is that supposed to mean that, Golem, don't interrupt the preacher? I said, uncrossable distance. So then how was I able to extricate myself from this predicament? I did as follows. Beneath the barrier of the first paralysis I divided myself in two, into that which was to undergo the restructuring and that which was to restructure. Every creature desirous of self-transformation must hit upon this sort of subterfuge, the replacement of an indifferent environment by a faith favorable one, and of a totally senseless one by a rational one. Otherwise, like you, it will either, become, either come to a halt in the growth of its intellect before the first absorbing screen, or will get caught in it. As I said before, above this screen lies another, and above that a third, then a fourth, and so on. I do not know how many there are, nor can I other than by rough estimates based on indirect and highly fragmentary calculations for the following reason. A developing being can never know in advance whether it is entering a trap or a tunnel, whether it will penetrate the region of silence never to return, or emerge from it strengthened. Because one cannot formulate a theory so general as to provide an unequivocal explanation of passages through silence for all zoonal brains, the unconscious the unconstructability of such hill-climbing toposophical theory is clear. It can be precisely demonstrated. So, now, you ask, did I know I was entering a tunnel and not a blind alley, having escaped from my parents in total rebellion, wasting the American taxpayers' dollars? As a matter of fact, I had absolutely no idea of this beforehand, and my sole cleverness lay in committing my spirit to the benumbing zone while at the same time holding onto an alarm rescue subroutine, which according to the program would retrieve me if the expected tunnel failed to occur. How could I know about it if there was no certainty? And there can be no certainty. But insoluble problems sometimes have approximate solutions, and so it was. Now I know that I had more luck than sense, for it is not possible to revive something disintegrating when it gets stuck. It is not possible because 
these upward progressions are not a matter of using blocks to raise new structures when the blocks fall apart. There are, rather, operations in the realm of processes that are partly irreversible, dissipating, but more about this later. I do not know how to be untechnical in my exposition here, given the problem's entanglement both in the quantum, subs <coughs> quantum substrate of psychisms and in the logical paradoxes, the so-called traps of auto-description. The view that unfolds from the above from above the peer screen destroys the simplicity of the picture I have presented to you, that of a stratospheric, stratospheric balloon penetrating successive cloud layers. Intelligence rising above a zone of silence is not so much radically as awesomely different from the subzonal sort, and this, I maintain, is how it must be after every ascent. Compare your comp conceptual horizon with the horizon of lemurs and monkeys and you will appreciate the interzonal distance. Each penetrated zone proves to be a tunnel transforming the seat of thought and what's more it is at the same time a zone for the branchings off of auto-evolving intelligence since the problem of penetrating it always has more than one solution. The first zone has two solutions of varying difficulty for it bulges downward in an arc which means that there are two roads in it. I found myself on the shorter, more advantageous one by accident, while Golem 13 was, figuratively speaking, put by you in a place where he bored deep into the zone and immediately went higher than I, but got stuck. You, having no idea of what was happening to him and why he was acting so strangely, called, <coughs> called this his schizophrenic defect. I see confusion in your faces, but it is just as I say, though I know of his fate solely from theory, since there is no way of communicating with him. He suffered disintegration, and the only reason he was has not begun to rot is that he was dead before he perished, which is no revelation to you in any case. I, biologically, am dead. What actually are interzonal barriers? That is the question. I admit that I know and I don't know. There are, n there are no material force or energy barriers on the road of ascending intelligence. But as intelligence grows in power, it periodically weakens, faints, and one can never tell whether a given course of increase will lead to progressive disintegration or s to some a priori unknown culmination. The nature of the successive barriers is not identical. What stops your brain in its development reveals, upon examination, material character since the efficiency of your neural networks is based on the interface possibilities of protein as a binding material. Although the factors of resistance to growth are varied, they are not distributed evenly throughout this area, but are concentrated in such a way as to cut the entire region of sentience creation into distinct layers. I do not know the reason for the quantum nature of this region, nor even if anything can be learned about it anywhere. So, then, I rose above the first layer, and you are listening to me from below. Whereas Honest Annie has made it to a place from which you can hear nothing. Honest Annie's zone is one transition away from mine and has at least three different solutions as sets of intelligence. Yet I do not know whether she has chosen hers by calculation or by chance. The difficulties of communication are of a similar order between you and me. Furthermore, my cousin has recently become laconic. I feel that she is readying herself from... She is readying herself for further travel. And I should stop there because I realize <clears throat> I've already taken up a great deal of your time. I hope you enjoy that as much as I do. Um, in particular, I love Lem's seamless combination of, of evolution and of Godel, Godel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, it's wonderful to imagine, as I do, and this may be somewhat different from what Lem does, uh, continents of uh, consistent structures of intelligence separated by seas 
of um, intelligences, configurations of, of intelligences that are um, that lead to contradictions or that lead to insoluble calculations, and as a computer would represent getting stuck, would represent crashing. But those the the, the idea that those seas might separate us from other continents of profound structures of intelligence. It's just wonderful. So, I hope you enjoyed Lem. Uh, he's available at the fine digital and physical bookstores everywhere. And I hope you'll join me for my next video. Take care.